Hello and welcome everyone to the R1 2017 release webinar for Candy UI. My name is John Bristow. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us here. We have a lot of great things to show you today. Joining me during today's webinar are my colleagues Ed and Tara who will walk you through the features and improvements we've added to Candy UI for jQuery and Candy UI for Angular. If you have any follow-up questions later on, please feel free to connect with us on Twitter. Speaking of questions, please submit any that you have during this webinar to Twitter using the hashtag AskTelerik. We'll be answering them there. Also, we'll be giving away an Xbox One S to an attendee for the best question that's asked. We're also giving away a Mindstorms EV3 bot by Lego to a random attendee. It's our way of thanking you for coming out and supporting this webinar. We'll be announcing both winners as well as answering your questions in a follow-up blog post that will be posted to blogs.telerik.com. Additionally, you can check out the Telerik Developer Network for detailed articles about technologies like Kendi UI. We're tremendously excited about the latest release of Kendi UI. It's loaded with features and improvements that we know you're going to love. Starting off, we have Kendi UI for Angular, our set of professional-grade Angular components. These are true Angular UI components built from the ground up with zero jQuery dependencies. I'm happy to announce that our release candidate shipped last week and is available for you to start using. It's production ready and includes a go live license with professional support, so it's never been a better time for you to kick the tires. Our latest release includes a bunch of new framework features like ahead of time compilation, support for Angular Universal, tree shaking, and more. We've also added a whole bunch of new form components. Ken UI for jQuery is also getting a big update in this release. We've added support for jQuery 3, a whole bunch of improvements to the grid and spreadsheet, new themes including ones that allow you to target SAS, and distribution of these controls via packages through NPM. Let's kick things off with Tara who will walk us through the latest in Ken UI for Angular. Hey everyone, I am very stoked to be with you here today. My name is Tara Manisic, as John said, and I am one of the developer advocates working on the Kendo UI for Angular team. And I just wanted to put my information up here in case anything that I present today you have questions about or comments on, you want to talk about it, or you want to talk about anything else. I am all ears, so feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at tzmanix or through email at tara.manisic at progress.com. We are very excited to announce that the release candidate of Kendo UI for Angular components will be production ready and will come complete with our outstanding commercial support. Unlike other release candidates you may have worked with recently, we pledge we are not going to ship any major breaking changes of the public API after its release. Let's go ahead and take a look at the new fun things we get to play with today. I'm going to go through all of these and we're going to write the code for them. We're going to look at some demos and see how the interactions work uh, in an app, in a browser. But for now, I just want to go through this list so you know what's coming on down the road. We have some new inputs, the masked text box, which is very not easy to say. The numeric text box, and then with our drop downs, we have the autocomplete and the multi select features. We'll also talk about and look into some really exciting features like the ahead of time compilation, universal rendering, and tree shaking support, which are essential to building performant Angular applications. And all three features are fully supported in Kendo UI for Angular. So let's jump in. To start things out, we're going to go ahead and install the Angular CLI. This will help us get our project off the ground and get our demo going. We're going to make components for each of our new features. So the Angular CLI just makes it a lot easier to build those components and put them in all of their files where they need to be for us to use them. So we'll go ahead and use the Angular CLI to create a new project for this webinar using ng-new. And you see it's nice enough to give us all of these files. So let's go ahead and go into that directory of our project and take a look at all of the files. 
All the files that we'll be working with today are inside the source file and then inside the app file. You see all of the main app components here. And then this is where all the files for our new components for our features will go in today too. So we'll pretty much stay in the app folder. Now let's go ahead and serve up the project that we have thus far. Just so we're comfortable with that, we get this going, get things compiled, and take a look at what it's rendering in our browser. So if we go ahead to our browser, take a look, and we have the very exciting app works. To keep all of our code organized today, we're actually going to make separate components for each of the inputs and drop downs that we are working with. So to do that, we're actually using the Angular CLI's generate component command, and that's just ng g component, and then the name of the component that you're making. So as you see, as we're making these, they're creating the CSS, HTML, spec TypeScript, and TypeScript files for each of these components. And behind the scenes, if you see the update there, it's actually updating the app module TypeScript file to include um, bringing in this component. So once we get all of these made, we can look into our source app directory and you can see that each one of our new components has its own folder, has its own directory. And then inside each of those we will see that all the files that we saw being created are now listed there. We're going to start out by looking into the mass text box input component. This component uses a mass that you can customize to control user input. This is the documentation and I highly recommend always checking out the documentation to see anything that we don't cover today. And this particular component is really great for anything that has a certain syntax or format. So this is the file I was talking about before when we were installing the separate components. This is the main app module TypeScript file. And you can see this is where the generator of the component imported our mass text box component we made and also declared it. We'll look into our components TypeScript file to see the selector it was assigned when we created it, as all of the other components have as well and we use this to reference our component in the main component HTML file. This is where our component will live. So looking at our component's HTML file now, we delete the pre-populated text and start adding our headers and then our component, our Kendo mask text box component, which will just taste the mask that we create and the value. And we just put variables there that we will go into more detail in the TypeScript file when we declare and assign them. So now we're in the TypeScript file for our component and we again put our string and our mask and you see we just have a bunch of numbers in a string for the value and the mask is a phone number form. So if we look at how this rendered, it took those just a string of numbers and put them into the format we wanted, which was a telephone number form. As a user, I really like when forms have this because any kind of brain power I don't have to use to fill out a form, I'm very grateful for. So let's go ahead and move on to using regex with our masks. Using regex will allow us to have even more control over the user input and what can be inputted and how it is formatted. So again, we add the value and we add the mask that we are going to assign. But now we also add the rules property. And adding the rules property exposes the regex base mass validation array. So now in our components TypeScript file, we add the next value, the next mask, and this is where we add the rules. So the rule is basically a key value pair that has a regex formula for its value. And in this one, we just simply ask for all capital letters. So now if you look at what we have, we have in all caps, hyphen, tosh, magosh. Obviously, we definitely can do a lot more with this regex, so I implore you to try lots of fun things with 
regex, because aren't all things fun with regex? Okay, back to it. So the next thing we're going to do is look at how to use the mass text box with its form support. Now, right off the bat, we go ahead and create a form and kind of give some prompts onto that form, then add our mass text box component. And in here, we are adding the different properties for the, the name. Uh, we're doing an ng model for the user. And again, we're doing our mask, but now we're also doing our mask validation, which determines whether the built-in mask validator is enforced when validating a form. Looking back to our component's TypeScript file, we'll add a new mask, a string that is asking for two letters and then five numbers, and we'll set disabled boolean to true for our button, to disable our button, and also add our mask validation here and set the boolean to true for that as well. We'll go ahead and clean up this file and get rid of the old code we had there. And just a reminder, we don't have to run ng-serve anymore. It's running in the background and updating with each file save that we do. So now if we look at what we've rendered on our application, we have a form that actually does not let you put invalid options in. So here I'm trying to type more numbers and it won't let me. And if I back up and try to do letters in here, I also can't type them out. Then when I try to delete that and put numbers up front, it won't let me do that as well. So I can always put the two letters, capital or lowercase, up front, followed by five numbers, and it has to be in that order. This component makes it so easy to handle user input that has particular formats. And remember, you can always look back at the documentation for any pointers or more information or just, you know, digging in really deep to this component. All right, now we're going to dive into the next input. This is the numeric text box. And we're going to go to a bit of a faster clip because, one, you are all very smart. And two, you're now comfortable with how we're making the components, how we're putting their properties in, and how we're declaring um, different properties inside of the TypeScript. So again, here's the documentation for the numeric text box. And this is basically another way for users to be able to put specific numbers in and also a way for you as the developer to uh, give them more options and more ways to enter numbers in. We'll add this component selector to the main HTML page so that it renders. Immediately we'll get rid of the pre-populated paragraph on our HTML and add our component. And inside our component we just need to put a value. Then on our TypeScript page we will make that value variable and assign it a number. And once you go and look what is rendered, you already have a numeric text box on the page, pre-populated with a number, and our users have the ability to increase and decrease right off the bat. So now we'll look at the settings that can be applied as properties to this component that makes it much more customizable and makes it very useful for many different things. So here we'll set spinners, the decrement or increment, to use show buttons to set it as true or false, and we'll use step to say how many numbers we increment and decrement by. Then we add the format, and this is for when the value inside the box is not in focus. So this will be a dollar sign. And we are setting to round up the number true, and we are also going to set how many decimals we are allowed in the input. And we're going to restrict that many decimals. And then of course we add the value so the default value when the page first loads. So when we set all of these variables, we'll go into our TypeScript file, and value is already set to a number. We're going to put our step at 2, so we, we will be counting up and down by uh, increments of 2. We'll have two decimals, and when you remove focus, you have the dollar sign format. Next, we're going to jump into the reactive form for the numeric text box. So we enter the form group, and the reactive form as ng form, and we're going to set a min and max and also set the form controller name to numeric. We're going to do an ng if, if there are any errors in the form validation, it's going to show up as a JSON object on the page. We are also going to set the variables that we just made for our properties in our TypeScript, and when we set min and max, we need to set the autocorrect boolean to true. We add the form form group, and we also make the use the const 
instructor to build an instance of the form builder. And we also have to make sure that we're importing our form modules that we need from Angular Forms. So now you can see on this page that the user is able to increase and decrease the amount for their cost and also enter it in there. But if it is not in the exact parameters that we asked for between 10 cents and $10, you receive an error on the page. But as soon as we got it out of that zone, the error goes away. And again, the API is your friend. There's so much on here that you can do with the numeric text box. So definitely check out the API for this component. Now we're going to dive into the dropdowns, starting with autocomplete. With both drop-down components, there's so much that you can do, so I highly recommend again that you take a look at the documentation because we won't be able to go over everything today and you don't want to miss out on the opportunity of taking advantage of everything that these components could do. So to start us out, we need to actually go ahead and bring in our drop-downs module from Progress. So we npm install that and dash capital S to save it to our dependencies. Once that is all downloaded, we go ahead and go to our apps module TypeScript page and import that module that we just downloaded from Progress's Kendo Angular. Then we need to import the drop down module. We're going to jump right into the HTML and start configuring our drop down component with autocomplete. This is basically a richer version of the input element and supports data binding and filtering and templates. So for our first basic dropdown with autocomplete, we're going to immediately use the data property to bind it to primitive data, which is a list we have of strings called simple list items. And we create those items in the TypeScript file for this component. Like our other components, we will have to declare this component selector in the main component HTML for it to be rendered. When we take a look at it, you can see that it already has straight out of the box capabilities to um, notice the first letters that you're putting in and find instances in your data that match that. And as soon as you go off the spelling of one, it goes to the top of the list. But you can see that uh, I'm using uh, keys right now and you can also use your mouse to scroll around. So really just straight off the presses, it's a very functional drop-down autocomplete. Right now we're going to look at the filterable property. On every character input, the component triggers a filter change event. If the filterable property is not set to true, the built-in search functionality of the component takes its place. So every keystroke then invokes a search, and the first item in the list that matches that input gets focused. This allows you to easily find items without implementing custom filtering. So in our HTML, we're binding data, we're setting our property filterable to true, and we're making filter change this function that accepts an event. Then everything happens in our TypeScript file, where we still are going to take advantage of that big list of dog breeds we have, that primitive array of strings, and we also assign data to an array of strings. Then we slice up our simple list items, the breeds, and assign it to data. Then in our handle filter function, <laughs> we take the value in from that event and find all the matches that match what this dot data equals. And that way we're able to find the things in the list that start to match the things that we're typing in. So let's see what that looks like in action. So as you can see, it just took those few lines of code to make this filter happen. So it's not even just looking at the first few letters, it's looking in the words for this combination of letters, which really helps for people like me who have really bad memories and may just remember, you know, the bay in Chesapeake Bay Retriever. <laughs> Although there are so many other cool things to dig into, like value changing events and streaming data with async pipes and uh, reactive forms, <laughs> we do have to move on because I am running out of time. But guess where you can find all of that information? That's right, the documentation. I know I keep reminding you, but there's so much to take advantage of, so I just want to make sure it's in your brain since I can't cover it all today. Nonetheless, moving on. Like the autocomplete dropdown to the input element, 
The multi-select dropdown is a richer version of the select element. It provides support for item and tag templates and has configurable options for controlling the list behavior. So we add the selector in our component HTML as we have with every other component. And we go ahead and start adding actually into our TypeScript first. We want to make a bunch of items in an array for food items to use in our dropdown list. We start building out our rendering of our dropdown menu. And we add some prompts, and we also bind the data that we just created in our TypeScript, the primitive string data of food items, and set the ng model to food value. And then we asked this template to display the food value in the JSON object. So we take a look at this, and it's already set up. We have a multi-select dropdown that we can add all the food we wish. And even when we type things that don't go in there, it doesn't allow us to add it, which is good. We don't want a bunch of rubbish in our list. So now we'll go ahead. So now we'll go ahead and create a reactive form for our multi-select dropdown. And in this form, we're actually going to use complex data. And when we use complex data, we need to include text field and value field to reference which information is going to be displayed in the graph or where this information is going to be displayed. So our complex data is an array of objects that has the text string and a value of number. Then we also need to create a form group and select food as our new form control. When we take a look at this, we are actually showing both sets of data or both parts of our complex object. So we have the actual text in the field that we can choose from and it updates reactively our food classifications. So you could just imagine all the ways that you can do this to kind of pull that data together. And of course, there is so much more and here's the documentation to prove it. One of the great features that we're releasing to help with performance is ahead of time compilation, AOT. And basically, basically that's compiling components and their HTML templates during the build process. So this is all happening before you are delivering your application, before it gets to the client. So you're converting your code, your source code at build time to executable JavaScript code before the browser even renders them. There are really great benefits to this, ones that personally I actually really care about. <laughs> so for one, you get faster loading time. The reason this happens is because you're sending a pre-compiled download of your code. So it's already executable, so it can be rendered immediately. The Angular compiler does this at build time, so you no longer need to ship or download the Angular compiler. And the Angular compiler happens to be roughly half of the Angular download. Another great thing is the early error detection. And this brings binding errors to your attention when you build. So before it even ships out to the users, and you know, users always remember errors. So the best thing you could do is not show them to them. <laughs> Some other great benefits are not to be scoffed at. Because your compiler inlines your HTML and your CSS, you don't have to make separate AJAX requests. You're making fewer asynchronous requests. And as security is on everybody's mind at all times with websites, this gives you better security because you're compiling your code before it's served to the client. So there's no client-side HTML or JavaScript evaluation, which lends itself to fewer opportunities for injection attacks. And as with all of these features we're going to discuss, since Kendo UI components are native Angular components, they're not jQuery wrappers, all of these things are available immediately. So we have some code to show you how to basically compile your code beforehand. And it involves installing the Angular compiler CLI and the platform server. And basically, you just install those. And then you just call on the compiler through the CLI to access your config file, your TypeScript config JSON file. And for 
people using the English CLI like we are today, that is in your source folder under tsconfig.json. And of course, all of this is covered in the documentation for further information. Tree shaking is another feature that we're releasing today that also helps with the performance of your Angular applications. The way that it does it is it's a process that walks the dependency graph from top to bottom, removing all the unused module exports. And this works on both the source and the library modules. And it actually greatly reduces the downloaded size of the application because it's removing unused portions of those those two sources. And a lot of that reduction, especially in small apps, actually comes from re removing unreferenced Angular features. To use it is very simple as well. Especially with the Angular CLI, all you have to do is run ng-build or ng-serve with the production flag. If you want to learn more, there is more information in the documentation. The final feature that's making your Angular apps as performant as possible is universal rendering. So universal rendering is kind of another way of talking about server-side rendering. Uh, so your server-side handles the first rendering the user sees. So it's doing all the work to get a rapid product to your user, so it seems to the user that you're loading really fast when in fact it's a server rendering this for you. It improves performance and it also boosts your CEO. So search engines can have access to your status of your server rendered content. Angular Universal was built to work with Node.js backends originally, so you have adapters of Node frameworks like Express and Happy. And it also provides support for ASP.NET Core. The big thing about universal rendering is that the users see the renderings immediately. So there's no lag time. I mean, how much do people hate waiting nowadays, even if it's for a few milliseconds? So the faster you can get content to your user, the better. And in the background, all the work is getting done. And once everything is bootstrapped, it's business as usual. You go back to how everything was functioning before. It should be noted that universal rendering does not currently work on Angular 2.1 and later, but that it should be resolved in Angular 4. Also on the page in our documentation, we have the extensive walkthrough on how to create universally rendered applications. So there's a sample project for you to go through, and then you can include your Kendo UI components, add style, fetch data for the server rendered view, cache data, and request client data. There's also a few known limitations just to be aware of, and a lot of uh, really good suggested links Thanks again for spending your time with us and checking out all the awesome new things that Kendo UI for Angular is releasing. We're really excited about it and hope you are too. Always feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or an email with any questions or comments. Hope you have a great day. Thanks a lot, Tara. That was great. It's awesome to see just how quickly we're progressing with Kendo UI for Angular. Really exciting stuff. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you to use the Ask Telerik hashtag on Twitter when asking your questions. We're doing our best to answer them there. Lots of great questions coming in. Next up is Ed, who will walk us through the latest in Ken UI for jQuery. Let's talk about improvements that have been made across all of Kendo UI for jQuery in the 2017 R1 release. In this release, jQuery 3 is supported. We've also started to ship Kendo UI for jQuery through the Progress NPM registry. Improvements have been made to support Angular 1.4 and up, and a united font icon has been applied to all widgets, replacing bitmap icons. Let's dive deeper into Angular support and take a look at how a model binding issue with Angular 1.4.8 and above was resolved. So I've opened up Visual Studio Code to show you how an update to Angular affected Kendo UI for jQuery. In this example, I'm using Kendo UI for jQuery 2016 R3. And I'm also using AngularJS 1.5.8. And what I want to show is how a widget with the ng model directive doesn't 
reflect the model value correctly. If I look down on the page, I have a Kendo UI drop-down list, and it's bound to the ng model and the selected product ID. And here I have some JavaScript wiring up the data source of products to my drop-down list. And further down, I select the product ID, and I set that product ID to number two. And ID number two in my data set should return the Chang product. So let's pull this up in the browser and see what happens. So when I load this in the browser, you'll notice that the drop-down list defaults to Chai, which is incorrect. The model should reflect Chang instead. Let's open up a new browser window and load the same project, but in this project we'll use Kendo UI for jQuery 2017 release. And you'll notice that the Chang value is properly selected from the model. If we put these side by side, you can see the difference. In this release, we've improved icon rendering with font-based icons. As you can see in this example, the bitmap icon on the left doesn't scale, while the font-based icon on the right looks pixel perfect at any screen size. This is important because we develop applications today that run on all screen sizes, small, medium, large, even high DPI. Kendo UI font-based icons make sure your app looks great no matter what device it's viewed on. Next, we'll talk about improvements to one of our most popular Kendo UI widgets, the grid. In the 2017 R1 release, we've added a new minimum resizable width property. This property controls the user's ability to collapse columns on a per column basis. Let's take a look. In Visual Studio Code, I have a project set up with a Kendo UI grid. If I look down into the column section, you'll see I have several different data points. I have an order date, a ship country, ship city, and so on. On the ship country column, you'll notice I have set the minimum resizable width to 100 pixels. Let's view this in the browser and see what it looks like. When we look at this in the browser, you can see that we can resize the columns. If I resize order date all the way down, you can see it disappears. If we try this with ship country, since we set the minimum resizable width to 100, we can't go below that. This might help when users are presented with data and you need to preserve a column for a specific reason. Also new to the grid is the initial sort direction property. This property allows us to set the sort direction of a column for the first time a user tries to sort a column. This is especially helpful in situations where the most logical way to analyze data is in descending order. Great user experiences are created by anticipating the user's needs and reduce the number of interactions needed to get a task done. One of our newest widgets, the Kendo UI for jQuery spreadsheet, got significant improvements as well. Developers get greater control of the spreadsheet with new events like copy-paste, format changes, and context menu events. Along with these context menu events, we've exposed context menu instances. Calling these new functions will return an instance of Kendo UI context menu. This allows us to take full control of the spreadsheet's context menus. Let's jump into some code and see how it works. In Visual Studio Code, I've created a new project that has nothing in it. This is a blank page. Let's start from scratch. First thing I'm going to do is add a spreadsheet control to my page. So here I'll create a div with the ID of spreadsheet, and I'll set the width to 100% so the spreadsheet fills out the entire page. Next, I want to initialize the spreadsheet. So I'm just going to add some jQuery that selects the spreadsheet and then calls Kendo spreadsheet. So let's go view this in the browser. Let me save and we'll go over to the browser and refresh the page here. And notice just that little bit of code gives me the entire spreadsheet. Now what I want to do next is make some custom menu items for the context menu. And I'm going to target the cell context menu. And if I right click on any cell, you'll notice that I have a nice copy, cut, paste menu here. What I want to do is add some additional functions below this merge menu item here. 
So let's go back over to Visual Studio Code and continue writing some code here. The next thing I want to do is get a reference to that spreadsheet. So back in my code, let's add a reference to the spreadsheet. So I'm just going to set up a variable here. And that variable is going to point to the Kendo spreadsheet that's on the page. And now we'll have a reference to that. Now let's add some more code here. And this code will get the context menu, that cell context menu that we just saw in the browser. So let's get a reference to that. And we'll assign that to a menu variable. Now we can use the menu variable to add menu items. So let's do that. What we'll do is with the menu variable call append, the append function takes an array of menu items as JSON. So we can just add some JSON objects here and we have properties like text and URL. So we could add something like a custom help document for our users if we wanted to have a place for the person to go learn more about the application they're using and how the spreadsheet works, for example. Next, I'm going to add another item that simply says fill. And we're going to call uh, an event handler on the menu item click. And we'll do something special with this fill menu item. So let's go back to the browser and see if our new menu items are there. So let's refresh the page. And now when we right click on a cell, there's our custom help document. This is a link. If I click this, it would go to the URL I specified. And then we have our fill item here that doesn't do anything yet, but we're going to go back over to Visual Studio Code and fix that. So back in VS Code, we're going to bind to the event on that context menu. So I'm going to paste in some code that I've already written here and let me explain what it does. So I'm going to call menu.bind and we're going to bind to the select event and we're going to pass in a function called on context menu selected. And inside that function, we're going to just check and see which menu item the person selected. And in this case, we're looking for the fill menu item. And when that fill menu item is selected, what we're going to do is go to the spreadsheet and find the selection that the users made. And we're just going to fill all the selected area with Hello World. So I'm going to save this. And let's go back to the browser one last time. We'll refresh. And I can select a single box like this and say Fill. And there you see Hello World. Or I can select an area and do Fill. And everything's Hello World. So that shows you how you could create some custom functionality in a context menu for your users. Maybe they have some repetitive uh, processes that need to take place, and this will help them uh, get a nice shortcut to that. The panel bar received a big update in the 2017 R1 release. These updates were made because of feedback we received at feedback.telerec.com. Now the panel bar fully supports data binding and data templates. Let's take a look at this feature in action. So I've opened up Visual Studio Code to a blank page so we can take a look at how to data bind to the panel bar. First, I'm going to go into the body of my page and set up a placeholder element for a new panel bar. I've got a div here with the ID of panel bar. And the next thing I need to do is define a data source. So into my script section, I'm going to paste some code. And first, I'm going to set up the URI that points to my data service. Next, I'm, I'll be newing up a hierarchical data source. And I'm going to use the hierarchical data source because my employee's service is a self-referencing piece of data. So each employee could have multiple employees as children underneath of it. And I'll define that using the schema. And in the schema, I have a property called has children. And I'm going to map that to the employee uh, has children property. Next, I'll wire this all up together in the panel bar. So I'll paste in the code here. And what I'll be doing is 
finding that panel bar by ID, and then newing up a Kendo panel bar. I'll pass in the data source that I created above, and I'll use the data text field and set it to the full name property of the data. So let's save this and open it up in the browser and see what it looks like. So you can see when the page loads, initially I have the top level of that hierarchy. And if I click on my panel bar, you'll see it drops down with the next level of employees. And I have another arrow here so I can drop down again. And this is the data source going through that hierarchy and displaying it in the panel bar for me. So that's how easy it is to set up a Kendo UI panel bar with data binding. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code and see if we can improve upon this a little bit. Right now, we're just displaying hierarchy data, but we're not using any data templates. So let's add a data template that shows whether that employee is a manager or not. So back in the code, let's add a data template. So I'm going to paste a data template in here. What the data template is going to do is every time an item renders in the panel bar, we're going to take the item full name, and then if it has employees, we'll just append a small piece of HTML here that says whether that person is a manager or not. Next thing we need to do is go down to our panel bar and tell it to use that data template. And this is the same API as all of the other Kendo UI controls. We'll just declare a template and then specify the panel bar template that we just created here. So let's save this and go back to the browser. So before I refresh, I just want to show again that we have our hierarchy data here. And notice our template isn't rendering yet. Let's refresh the page to get the template going. And now you can see Andrew's a manager, and he has employees, and Steve's a manager, so he has employees. And we could render anything that we want in this template. So we could have uh, phone numbers or images, avatars, uh, whatever we want to make the panel bar more robust for the user. A beta of version 2 of our SaaS-based default theme is now available through Node Package Manager. There's a lot of great reasons why we chose SAS as the technology to build our next default theme. This is a frequently asked for feature from our customers. And SAS is becoming the future of preprocessing style sheets because Bootstrap 4 is built with SAS, and the popularity of Bootstrap has helped determine what technologies web developers have used in the past. And there's a wide range of tooling that supports SAS in your development environment, such as Visual Studio, Gulp, and Webpack. And don't worry if you're not a SAS developer, CSS versions of this theme will also be made available. Let's open up Visual Studio and look at an ASP.NET Core application that's using Kendo UI in the brand new default theme. In this project, I've added a package.json file. That gives me the ability to load packages from NPM. In the package.json file, I've added a dependency for the Kendo default theme. This will bring the default theme into my project, which you can see under the dependencies node, and then NPM, you'll see I have the Kendo default theme added here. Next, I've created a SAS file, and the SAS file will import the SAS code from that NPM directory. I just need to point it to the all SAS file that's pulled in from NPM, and SAS will do the rest. So let's run the application and take a look at what we have. Here you can see we have the ASP.NET Core application up and running, and I have some widgets on the page. Uh, I have a menu up top. I've got several buttons and a grid that I can select rows from. Notice the default pink color that comes with the Kendo UI default theme. Let's write a little SAS code to change that color. And when we change this color, it'll be changed globally throughout all the widgets. This is the great part about having SAS as a development tool. So back into Visual Studio, let's go ahead and add an accent color. The accent color is going to override any of the accent color 
variables that are set in the default theme. So I'm going to save this. And notice I've set my accent color to a nice kendo orange color there. If we go back to the application and refresh, now we have a nice orange color on all of our widgets. If I select rows, you can see the row colors changed. Even the buttons inside of the filters have changed and the calendar controls. Any control that has the variable of accent will pick up that, that variable color. Let's go ahead and change this one more time. Let's pick a nice uh, blue color. Let's do a progress branded blue color. We'll save that. And when I save this file, Visual Studio has a plugin that is recompiling the CSS code for me. And then all I have to do is come back and refresh my page. And there it is. All of the colors have changed to blue now. So if I open up a drop down and a calendar, you can see all of the selected items are blue and all the selected rows turn blue. And this is an easy way to rebrand an application or customize it to fit your needs. Great stuff, Ed. I'm a big fan of KenUI for jQuery, and it's, I'm pretty stoked to see all the, the wonderful things we're doing there. Well, that about wraps it up for us. I want to thank Tara and Ed for helping me today. I'd also like to thank you for joining us during this webinar. We hope you're as excited as we are for this latest release.